This would be compulsory. And the idea was that it would cover history, creed, rituals, music, symbols, ethical commands, and prohibitions. That's it. Just well-attested, non-controversial facts that everybody can agree to about the world's religions, and that that should be a curriculum which starts in grade school, goes into middle school and high school. Now, I believe as strongly as anybody in the principle of freedom of religion. So notice that this in no way violates freedom of religion. As long as you teach your children this curriculum, you can teach them anything else you want. Anything else you want, provided it doesn't disable them from further informing themselves. So it honors the principle of freedom of religion. Now I've been discussing this proposal since I put it in my book for a year and a half now and I've had the support actually of a lot of, of even right-wing Christian leaders who say this is great, this is great, yeah we're all for it. But uh, uh, Dinesh is on record as, uh, as opposing it. Um, here's what he has to say. He says, Daniel Dennett urges that the schools teach religion as a purely natural phenomenon and then he goes on to say by this he means that religion should be taught as if it were untrue. Oh no. That's not what it means and I've never said that. And this is simply a misrepresentation by Dinesh. Uh, I expanded on my point on the blog on faith which some of you may have seen and I thought it was not it was such an obvious implication that I put it in parentheses. I said, notice that the truth or falsity of any religious doctrines would not be included in the curriculum, since not a single point of religious doctrine is agreed upon in straightforward fact by the world community. So Dinesh has misrepresented my position, and maybe that's why he is opposed to it. Uh, I don't know, maybe now that he understands it better, he'll be in agreement of it. We'll see. <laughs> now, my reason my reason for this is not the reason he suggests. He thinks I'm trying to, to uh, wipe out religion. On the contrary, it's my recommendation for how to preserve the best in religion and get rid of just the stuff that we all want to get rid of, the toxic stuff. And it's a rather simple argument. All religions have toxic versions therein. That is, there are, there are anti-social fanatical elements in, in every major religion, in, in Hinduism, in Islam, in, in various kinds of Christianity, and so forth. And as near as I can see, this is an empirical claim. I haven't done direct research on it, but combing the literature seems to me pretty clear. All toxic versions depend on the enforced ignorance of the young. It's only by keeping your young people ignorant of other religions that you can, that you can preserve this. So my sort of public health measures say just, just don't permit that enforced ignorance to go on. Informing the young, we inoculate them against toxic forms of religion. And my understanding of this is as follows. A religion that can survive under this sort of Free information deserves to survive. It's a benign form of religion. Let it flourish. And a religion that can't survive without the enforced ignorance of the young deserves to go extinct. But I don't know, maybe Dinesh disagrees with that. We'll see. He quotes me. This is something Dinesh does in his book. He, he quotes in a context of disparagement, but you're never quite sure if he agrees with the, what he's quoting or not. Parents, he's quoting me now. Parents don't literally own their children the way slave owners once owned slaves, but are rather their stewards and guardians, and ought to be held accountable by outsiders for their guardianship, which does imply that outsiders have a right to interfere. I stick by that. I think that's true. And I want to know, does he dissent from this statement? He presents it as if he disagrees. I'd like to know, does he actually dissent from this statement? So what kind of facts would we teach in this curriculum? I'm just going to whirlwind tour the facts. What do you suppose this is? this is? This is several million people on the banks of the Ganges River as seen from outer space, one of the largest congregations of human beings ever in history. Now that's a really interesting phenomenon that cries out for an explanation. What on earth explains such an amazing congregation of bipeds? Well, it's of course, this is a Hindu country, and the, the, the Hindu religions are older 
than Christianity, older even than Judaism, and they, unlike, unlike uh, say, Christianity, they don't, they don't have a sort of single founder. Um, their uh, name for the, the highest god is, is Brahman, and everybody has a, a soul, an Atman, and if you perfect and purify your soul, uh, that's Nirvana, and you are, become one with Brahman. But in addition to Brahman, they have lots of gods. They have, for instance, Ganesh, the Indian god, and uh, Lakshmi, the god of light. And they have avatars, which are, which are uh, gods come to earth. Uh, and they have uh, names that are uh, familiar to you, I'm sure, uh, 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 such as uh, Krishna and Rama. And they have their holy texts, the Upanishads and the Vedas and so forth. And then you know also about, about the sacred cows. Um, even meat eaters in uh, India, by and large, don't eat beef. They may, may eat other animals, but, but beef eating is pretty well uh, out for, uh, for the people in India. Except, I guess, for Christians, like, like the Christians in India. Now, then, moving along very quickly, here we have Islam. By the way, this is, this is not a picture of Muhammad. As you know, they don't like to have pictures of Muhammad. That's Ali, his son-in-law. And it was the murder of Ali way back in 662, in the very early days of, of Islam, which led to the split, which we know today as the Sunnis and the Shias. Um, Ali was the fourth caliph. As you know, Muslims are supposed to pray five times a day. They're forbidden to drink alcohol, and they hope to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, as you see in the pictures. Then we have the, then we have the various brands of, of Christianity, Roman Catholicism and Russian Orthodoxy and, and Greek Orthodoxy and Protestant denominations by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And uh, just for local color, I put on the top, on the right there, the mother church of, of the Church of Christ Scientist right here in Boston. And then down in the lower right-hand corner is the Mormon Tabernacle. And I'd certainly want students to learn about, about, about the Mormons, too, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. On the left, you see the angel Moroni, who Joseph Smith tells us uh, came to him. Let me get the date right. I don't want to make a mistake. Uh, in 1823, on the 21st of September, the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith, and then he came back four years later with uh, what I'm reporting, of course, is, is not, this is Mormon doctrine, Mormon creeds. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying this is what Mormons believe. Uh, uh, he brought with him these golden tablets on which were written Egyptian symbols of some kind, and with the aid of some magic stones, Joseph Smith uh, was able to translate them, and that's where we get the Book of Mormon. So we'd certainly want people to know about, about that. And then here, uh, more recent religions still talk about Latter-day. This is just the 50th anniversary of the John Frum religion on the island of Tana. This started after World War II. GIs on a neighboring island of Efate came in, they built an airstrip, they had all kinds of amazing cargo that the people on the island of Tana had never seen, and they wanted some of that cargo, and so they decided that the GIs were sort of like gods, and they started a religion, they used the American flag, they dress up in uh, sort of their idea of GI costumes, they carry bamboo uh, uh, in imitation rifles, uh, and they get into formations, and they're waiting for John Frum. John Frum? Who's John Frum? Well, there was nobody in the U.S. military named John Frum. It seems to be a corruption of John 